Welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast, where we bring Sunday home. Join us as we dive deeper into First Baptist's weekly sermons, discuss practical applications, and answer your questions. Hello and welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast. I'm Jordan Upton, and with me as always is Pastor Jeff Reynolds. Jeff, how are you doing today? Jordan, I'm doing great, man. Now, I don't have any newborns at the house, and so I'm much more interested in hearing how you're doing right now. Yeah, so we have little Thomas at our house. Uh, he is a uh, beautiful, healthy little boy, um, always smiling, always... Uh, <laughs> his his eyes have been open almost since day one, and he's just always looking around, seeing who's there, and you know, he'll give it a little smile, you know, a little toothless grin. I so, love it. Um, it's... Uh, uh, very good that, um, you know, especially with some of the lack of sleep you get, that they're, oh. they're just so cute. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have to be. Yeah. Because, yeah, you're right. Those those first few weeks, I can recall um, not wishing time away, but yep. uh, looking forward to, to calmer times. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And thank God. He's healthy. Taylor's healthy. Our, our little boy, Isaac, uh, our firstborn, is the most affectionate little two-year-old you could ever ask for. I love that. So I'm just almost tearing up here talking about it. I'm just so thankful for for my whole family. And, well, you uh, have a beautiful family. The Lord has blessed you, and you and Taylor are building a household upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ, and uh, that's what we talked about and prayed for. That's what you all uh, wanted to do, and now it's happening. And it's really beautiful to see from the outside looking in. So God bless you, man. That's so exciting. Uh, two boys, Isaac and Thomas. Yeah. And uh, who knows how the Lord is going to bless the world through those young men. It's going to be great. Amen. And listeners, thank you for uh, all of your prayers. Uh, we really felt it, and we're really appreciative of the uh, care that you all had for us. And uh, thank you for listening to the Sabbath episodes. We were excited to make those and um, uh, put that content out for you. So thank you for listening to those. And we're excited to be here today, back in the booth, back in the saddle. Well, let me tell you, as a listener to the Sabbath podcast, you did a great job. I mean, it was really cool. And um, it was really neat how you kind of talked about the theory, the biblical theory behind the practice of Shabbat, and then what that looks like in your household and why it matters to you. And I really appreciate how you shared that, not in some sort of legalistic way, but rather in a way that that just communicated, hey, we found this beneficial in our lives. And, um, you know, I think that for, for all of us, particularly in an American context, um, we tend to run wide open 24-7 and wonder why we're frazzled. Um, God designed us to have a Sabbath, and uh, the way you guys practice Shabbat is just a really beautiful thing. Um, Doing so, as you said, in honor of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, just as Jesus practiced Shabbat. And so, as a listener to those podcasts, thank you for doing that, and thank you for sharing that content. That was really, really good and really helpful. Really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for saying that, and and again, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, listeners, for listening. Uh, it was a blessing making it, and it was a blessing uh, uh, thinking about it and writing it out. So yes, sir. Yeah. So we have a lot going on here at First Baptist, uh, and most of the a lot is VBS. VBS so. week. It is wonderful. Uh, I believe we have a record number of children. Wow. Who are a part of it this year, and uh, phenomenal number of volunteers. I don't know any any concrete numbers to share. Um, because they were kind of in flux a little bit last night. We're recording this on Monday, so we have had one night of VBS, and it was a phenomenal night. I'm so thankful for Lauren Parrish, uh, our minister of children here at First Baptist Church. She does such a wonderful job, and she has built a team of volunteers that are second to none. Uh, our Narthex has been transformed into a marketplace, and, and, and the artistic and creative abilities of our folks here are just unbelievable to me. I, I don't have those abilities, mm-hmm. and to see uh, not only the amount of, of manpower, the amount of work and energy and hours and blood and sweat and tears that go into all these things, but, but just the creativity that people uh, display. It's just wonderful. Um, VBS is one of those events that really takes the whole church. And so it's not just the children's ministry, but it's all of us coming together, using what God has given us, and employing those gifts 
to bless children and families in our community. And it's just so beautiful. So um, thank you to everyone who has done anything or is doing anything uh, to be a part of Vacation Bible School. What a blessing. And who knows what God is going to do with your investment. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. So the theme for this year's VBS is Babylon. So it's talking about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and some of the themes of uh, the, the exile in Babylon. So I, I appreciate, Jeff, that your sermon series is going through the book of Daniel and going through um, some of these stories that they'll be talking about. And you know we'll be talking about some of the things here on this podcast that they're talking about this week during VBS. That's right. So the the passage from this weekend, from this Sunday, was Daniel 3, 1 through 30. I'm not going to read the whole passage. I'm just going to sum it up real quick. So essentially, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon made a golden idol for his people to worship. Even though there was a threat of death, there were several exiled Jews who refused to bow to it. So these were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who are better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they stood firm under pressure and did not bow, uh, even when they were giving another opportunity before the king. So because of that, they were thrown into the furnace, uh, blazing furnace, but God brought them out and they were not even, they didn't even smell a fire uh, miraculously. And so Nebuchadnezzar publicly recognized the might and the power of the God of Israel. So Jeff, in talking about that, you said that um, sometimes we have to be delivered not from the fire, but through the fire. So that kind of shapes the questions that I wanted to ask for today. So the, the kids are learning these stories about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, uh, living out their witness and testimony during the exile in the Babylonian era. So what are some of the big lessons from this Babylonian exile, from the time that the Jewish people were exiled from the land of Israel to the land of Babylon? Well, we know that the exile was a result of sin and that the reason that the Babylonian exile happened um, was because God's people continually turned away from him. And so this was an act of judgment upon his people, an act of discipline. Um, we're encouraged by the words of Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, where God is speaking to the exiled people, and he says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Um, but settle in. You're going to be here for a while. And so God knows what he's doing. God is never capricious. He's never he's never just trying something to see how it works. God fully understands everything that he's doing. Um, but really what you have here is this wave of young men taken into the service of King Nebuchadnezzar uh, really about 20 years before the taking of Jerusalem. So Daniel and and this group of people go, uh, they're taken in about 605 B.C., and then Jerusalem would fall in 586 B.C., and remember, B.C. counts down. Mm -hmm. So um, you're talking about a couple of decades before the fall of Jerusalem, but um, what you see with Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah is a commitment to living out their faith in an alien culture to which they have been taken against their will, however, under the guidance of Almighty God. God allowed this to happen. In fact, God is the one who caused this to happen as an act of judgment upon His people. But they still had a responsibility to stand firm. They had a responsibility to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob— and to do so faithfully, regardless of their circumstances. And so that's what we see. We see in Daniel chapter 1, for example, Daniel resolving not to defile himself. We see in Daniel chapter 2, when Daniel comes to, to interpret the dream, to tell Nebuchadnezzar what his dream is and what it means, um, Daniel is giving all the glory to Almighty God for that interpretation. He's saying, I can't tell you anything, but God knows all things. And so um, and then again in chapter 3, we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refusing to transgress the first commandment. When God said, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, so that means, and, and then the second commandment is like it, don't make for yourself an idol or a graven image and worship that. Um, they refuse to transgress the first or second commandments because God is jealous and, and God commands us not to do that. And so what we see is that they are standing firm in their faith saying, and, and, and this is not original to me, 
some other preacher said this. If I knew who the preacher was, I would tell you. But this is one of those things that has kind of been passed down from preacher to preacher over the years. But, mm-hmm. but the question is this, do I do what the king wants and hope that God understands, or do I do what God wants and hope the king understands? And so that's really the question that they are faced with repeatedly. Do I do what God has commanded, regardless of what consequence it may bring, uh, or do I bend in my faith and bow the knee to this king who is commanding me to transgress my faith and to transgress my God? Yeah, and as I was thinking about these questions and these sermons, it it struck me that you know, even this time during exile is different from, you know, obviously when they're in the kingdom and there right. is a kingdom of Israel or even a kingdom of Israel and a kingdom of Judah. Right. Um, and that's different from, you know, the time of the judges in some ways, but that's, that's right. even, you know, different from being in slavery in Egypt and then before with Abraham. It's like you've gone through all of those steps as a people and now that's all been taken away. Yeah. It's, it's like you're almost back to square one, but maybe you're even backward because, you know, what you had was taken away. Yeah. Um, now, of course, they had the promises that, you know, these terrible things would happen, the curse would come upon them with disobedience, but then that, you know, they would be restored. And Jeremiah is saying that, you know, even before it happens. Right. Um, but one of the things that I kept circling back to was this concept from Rabbi Mayer Soloveitchik, who talked about how the the term Hebrew... Um, you know, we use it a lot, and what it means is crossed over. Um, so it's like, you know, someone crosses over a river or something yeah. like that. So he was applying it to the Exodus because when Moses goes and talks to Pharaoh about the Exodus, he says, you know, the Lord tell, told me, you know, to tell you, let my people go. Right. And Pharaoh's like, I don't know who you're talking about. So then he circles back and he's like, oh, the God of the Hebrews told me to say this. Yeah. So he found great meaning in that because what Moses is basically saying is like the God who travels with the people where they go Hmm. is saying to do this. Hmm. So instead of the, uh, you know, the Egyptian pantheon, which is, you know, uber powerful within Egypt and guards the land of Egypt. Sure. Like we have a God who came with us from across a river, Hmm. you know, and is with us now in our slavery. Um, Wow. You know, and he's going to deliver us from your gods and we're getting out here. Well, and all the plagues, uh, if you study the plagues, they are individual, they are yeah. individual uh, plagues against certain Egyptian gods. And it's it's really kind of cool to see how God does that. Uh, he's he uh, do, God doesn't miss the details. No. And I love that about him. Absolutely. So I, I was thinking about that as we were ta- talking about, you know, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego here, because, you know, God is still with them. He, yes. He's not, you know, a he's not a loser god as it were mm. um you know he's not you know the god of a people who was beaten by another people with stronger gods and then you know their their god is done now they've got to worship another god and hope that they can recoup or something like that it's like no i you know the lord told you this would happen but i'm still with you yeah i i'm still with you in exile and what a powerful lesson when we go through hard times yeah and it seems like God is far. God is not near. Uh, if God were paying attention, we wouldn't be going through this. Well, what we have here is, you no, know, God is is very much paying attention. Now, when we go through hard times, is that an act of judgment from God? Well, in some cases, it might be uh, God disciplining us as sons because He loves us. It might be a consequence of our own decision. It might be a lot of things. And so I think we have to be careful not to try to to delve into the mind of God and 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 try to satisfy ourselves with the question why, um, because quite frankly, in my experience, I think that's a question to which if we ever learn the answer to the why, it will come on the back end where hindsight is twenty twenty, And that back end may be glory. Mm-hmm. It may be that we look back over the landscape of our lives from a heavenly perspective and see, oh, you really did work all things together for good in that moment. Um, but just because we find ourselves in a difficult circumstance doesn't mean that God has abandoned us. 
And that's so hard to remember when you're in the middle of it. So, so some of you are listening to this right now, and you are right in the middle of the storm. You're right in the middle of the fiery furnace, and you feel like God has abandoned me. Well, no, that's not true. For God to, to abandon you, he would have to be breaking his promise, and God keeps his promise. If you love the Lord and you trust and follow Jesus Christ and you've been called according to his purpose, he is with you and he is actively working things together for your good in ways you cannot now perceive. And you have to remember that. You say, well, I don't feel that. Okay, well, sometimes our feelings lie to us. Um, I don't sense that. Well, sometimes our senses lie to us. What do we do? We go back to the truth that God has communicated. And even though these young men were in exile, you know, they had a choice. They could say, you know what? We're in exile. Forget it. I'm not doing all this. I'm not, I'm not keeping up with these 613 commandments. This is ridiculous. If, if, if God loved us and if God was real, we wouldn't be here right now. Well, they chose not to. To do that, they didn't abandon their faith. They didn't turn away from God. They chose to worship, serve, and to worship and to serve Him regardless of their circumstance. And so that's such an important thing. And, and you mentioned the history of Israel. You know, how many times did God show Himself to be present with the people? You know, He tabernacled with them through the wilderness. He was there with them. He went where they went. They followed His lead. When the cloud moved, they moved. You know, that kind of a thing. But God was there with them. And then Solomon builds the temple, and God comes to be with His people, and He 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 meets with them there, and God is with them. And through it all. Now, what do they do? They keep turning away, keep turning away, keep turning away, keep turning away. Um, But even in the exile, God was with them. Absolutely. So that'll take us into the next question. So on Sunday, you talked about how God's way always works out better in the end. And you kind kind of alluded to this uh, on some level, what what you were saying there. Um, So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were rescued from the fire furnace. Like yes. it, it works out well for them. You know, the the king is even, you know, glorifying God at the end of the story. It's yeah. like, you know, it's it's a fairy tale ending uh, it, it, for this particular story. Right. But even within that story, when the king was, you know, grilling them, they explicitly said that God might not rescue them from death, but they weren't going to turn away from God. That's right. Um, so what what can we take from that? It, what What are the lessons from that kind of faith Acknowledging that the the rectification of these things might come in glory, yeah. it might not come in this lifetime. It might not come in this particular situation that we're facing. Well, it's an inspiring moment when they say, "Our God is able to deliver us from your hand." But even if He doesn't, we're not going to worship your image of gold. Um, that's the moment we all want, <laughs> you know, as we yeah. as we follow Jesus. You know, there have been times when when you think about, what if I'm faced with the question, will I stand like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did? And and what does that come from? Well, it comes from a depth of faith that really understands that our God is transcendent, and He is not bound by time and space. And for all of us who trust and follow Jesus, we are not bound to a great degree because when our life on this earth comes to an end, we continue to live on. And so sometimes I think when we sing Amazing Grace and the song says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Well, it's so impossible for us to wrap our minds around that. You know, we're talking about an infinite amount of time and, and we live in finite lands and in a finite mind and in a finite world and we are finite creatures and 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 for us to wrap our minds around being in in glory for 10,000 years and having no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun it, it we don't have a frame of reference for that we can't we can't understand that so sometimes i think we uh, kind of forget about that part But Francis Chan um, did a sermon illustration one time that that really shook me, and and you can find it on YouTube, I'm sure, um, if you look up Francis Chan rope illustration. And what he did was he had a big, long piece of white rope, 
And it was so long that it, I think it went all the way around the sanctuary that they were in. I mean, it's just so long. And he was holding the beginning of the rope. And maybe an inch of it was painted red. And he said, if this rope represents eternity, the red portion is your life now. And he said, we spend so much time worried about this tiny red portion when we've got all of this eternal life to come, this this unending, it's an imperfect analogy because the rope has to stop at some point, and everlasting life doesn't. Um, but this life on this earth seems so significant to us now because it's all we've ever known. But in the context of what awaits believers in Jesus Christ, this is just a whisper. I mean, it's it's it's... It's here today, gone tomorrow, and and within the context of an ever expansive eternity, I, I can't even wrap my mind around that. Um, this is such a minuscule portion of our lives. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego understood that. They understood that. All of the martyrs who have died um, for their faith, they they understand that. Um, sometimes we struggle to understand that. Sometimes we uh, have a very limited frame of reference and we don't understand what's to come. And I, I think that we do that to our own mental and emotional harm. Um, but if we really understood the glory that is to be revealed in us that will so far eclipse any suffering we've ever had to endure, man, we would have a different way frame of reference uh, for living this life. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego understood that and said, look, even if we die... It's okay, because God still got us. You know, I think about Jesus going to the cross, and yes, he he had his moment of agony in Gethsemane, and um, I'm sorry, I'm picturing Gethsemane right now, having now been there. So you should go to the Holy Land with me because you'll do the same thing. But he had this moment of agony in Gethsemane, but it wasn't because of what the future held; it was because of the pain of the moment. <laughs> But the moment was going to be very quickly eclipsed by an empty tomb and uh, a resurrection from the dead. And, you know, I, that, that changes everything in the approach. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through pain for a moment, but then the pain goes away and all is well. So it's, it's, it's a different way of approaching life, but that's the way of approaching life that God's called us to live. Absolutely. So that will take us into today's listener question. That will take us perfectly into today's listener question. Listeners, if you have a question, just go to the link in the show notes or comment on the post below. Jeff, our culture is increasingly secular and anti-God. How do we raise our children to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who retained their witness in the face of persecution? Shema Israel, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. That's how we do that. And uh, that was a little Hebrew. That was um, Shema. That was the Shema of Deuteronomy chapter 6. So as I turn my Bible over there, what a great question. Um, and the Shema of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning with verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. There's the answer. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no magic answer other than we who trust and follow Jesus have a responsibility to, to teach our children. So what does that look like for me? Okay, because here's the deal. Guys, some of you all are listening to this, and, and you've had children who've gone astray. God bless you, okay? You created, uh, with God's help, you created a human being who has a free will. They have the ability to decide, and you could have been the perfect parent, and they've rebelled. Well, the Bible doesn't say that some have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So all of us have rebelled against the, the good teaching that we have received. Here's my inclination. The more that I can get the Word in my children, the more that I can model an honest faith before them, 
not just showing them some perfect veneer, but showing them all the realities of what it looks like to live out the faith as a sinner saved by the grace of God. In other words, I make mistakes, and there are times when I have to explain my mistakes to my children, apologizing even to my children. Um, But if I will get the Word in them, expose them to the truth of Almighty God, and then seek to live out the faith in an honest way and have honest conversations with them, that to me, <laughs> I'll let you know in, in several years how it turned out. I'll tell you another thing that we're doing. Um, my son's getting ready to turn 16, and um, I have given him uh, both uh, a mandate and a deal. Um, before he drives, he will have read the entire Bible, and uh, that is non-negotiable. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, he's working through it right now. He's 15. And, uh, and, and to some degree, we're working through it together. But he's got to read it after he reads a book um, or listens to a book. He can listen to it, too. Faith comes by hearing. Um, he then has to talk to me about the book. And you say, well, Jeff, you have a Ph.D. from a seminary. Yep. And the Lord made me his dad. Now, the quizzes are not very hard, but we talk through the book. And I want him to at least grasp This is what happened here. These were the main players here. This is how God showed himself to be faithful here. So, and and then quite frankly, my son's a multi-sport athlete in high school and and doesn't have a whole lot of free time, so I'm treating it as a job. So I'm I'm providing remuneration toward the purchase of a car um, for this investment. And uh, here's why. When, When he gets behind that wheel and he pulls out of my driveway... That is a level of freedom that I remember getting at age 16. And um, I also remember my personal level of stupid at that time. (laughs) And so what what I want to do is at least make sure the word's in there, you know, Uh, make sure the seed is planted. And, And I'm so thankful for all of his, you know, Vicki Donaldson, who is his minister of children, and uh, and then now uh, Blake Sapp, who was his youth pastor, and now T.J. Renfro, who is his youth pastor. I'm thankful for every person who in, who was involved. Uh, you, Jordan, uh, as you mentored him in the faith, as he worked for you when you were our director of broadcast and media outreach, and you you were gracious enough to train him on operating a camera, and you you did more than that. You mentored him in the faith. And that 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 influence in his life is still there, and I'm very very deeply thankful for that. Um, so I'm very thankful for the people that um, pour into his life. We prioritize being at church. You know, my responsibility as a parent is to seek to um, give them the best shot possible. I can't decide for them. Um, I can't make them trust and follow Jesus Christ as adults, um, but I can give them every opportunity to be exposed to the teaching of Jesus uh, and to the truth of Jesus lived out before them. And so that's why church community is so important. I I mean, i got to tell you, uh, coming back out of COVID, just about every church is at least 30% low on in-person attendance. Um, And and we're we're about the same. we uh, our broadcast attendance really exploded, which is awesome. And our live stream attendance, um, we started live streaming in January of 2020. God is sovereign, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just yeah, unbelievable. Amen. <laughs> um, so that kind of really blew up. But but some of us got used to the habit of of not going and joining physically with the body of Christ on Sunday. Uh, and I think to our detriment, because there's something to saying, we prioritize this in our family. We go, we gather with the saints. Yes, they're imperfect, but we've been given the gift of one another to stir one another toward love and good works. And it's important that we gather with the body of Christ on Sunday mornings. And uh, so I would encourage you, if 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 that's kind of been a habit that's fallen by the wayside for you, uh, make it a priority. Um you know, we make so many things priorities in our lives that uh, are good things, but um, you know, chances are good that statistically our children aren't going to become 
professional athletes. Maybe they will, but man, we'll, we'll move heaven and earth to make sure they get to their athletic uh, event. Chances are good that they're not going to be the next, you know, great performer, uh, making millions of dollars for their ability on their instrument or with their vocal ability, but we'll move heaven and earth to get them to their lessons and all that. But, but when we treat church as something that's, eh, well, you know, it's, it's not that important, then our kids see that. And uh, that's going to shape how they live their lives after they leave our homes. So again, no guilt, no shame, just we're all on this journey together. All of us are sinners in need of a Savior, and, uh, and sometimes God calls us to, uh, to turn away from new habits and, and embrace the things that, that He's called us to be. Yeah, and I'm just thinking back through several of the things you said there. One, I love that you compared going to football practice with going to Sunday school, just in that, you know, this is not just something to check off. It's like going to church, you know, going to... Uh, Sunday school classes, these things are helping prepare us for eternity and helping us come closer to God. Um, And I I love that you pointed out that um, a lot of it really comes down to individual uh, practice on our parts and and, uh, example on our parts. If if we're teaching to be repentant and to be forgiving and faithful in the community and faithful to your family— you know, we have to actually do those things individually ourselves. Yeah. Um, and, and that, you know, displays a high level of uh, humility when you can apologize to people who are, <laughs> you gave birth to, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, and, 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 and that's, to me, that's mentoring. That's, you, you've got to have a, an appropriate degree of transparency. And that doesn't mean we air all our dirty laundry right. for our children, right. you know, that sort of a thing. But, it's very important that we're honest because you know kids kids catch they see way more sometimes than we want them to and um, <laughs> and sometimes replicate way more you know uh, but but I think we've got to be honest because they, they 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 can sniff out a fake anywhere I mean kids are so quick to sniff out a fake like yeah I heard somebody say if kids and animals won't go near a person you should be suspect mm. <laughs> you know uh, and I think that's good advice so just we got to be honest we got to be real with our kids yeah yeah Jeff thank you for all of that and I'm so excited to be back with you I'm so excited that we're back in action and uh, going into our second year here of this podcast here in August. So. Yeah, this is this is one of my favorite moments every single week. So thank you. And then I get to listen to it. I always listen to it to uh, to hear how good of a job you did and to see how I can get better. So um, <laughs> it it is uh, it's a wonderful thing. Thank you. This was all your idea, and uh, it's it's turned out to be a pretty great idea. So I appreciate that, man. Absolutely. Can you pray us out for today? Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we confess we are in need of you for everything. Every breath we take, every time our heart beats, every step we take, every bit of that. Um, We confess you are our creator and you are our sustainer. And without you, we can do nothing. But we're thankful that through Christ, all things are possible and that we can live out our faith in in a sin fallen world in a way that glorifies you and blesses others. And that's what our prayer is. Pray that you would help us to model lives of faith for those you've entrusted to our care, recognizing that they've got to make their own decision uh, and they've got to do their own thing. They will stand before you and give an account of their lives on their own. But Lord, help us to give them every tool, every opportunity to trust and follow you and help us to live our faith authentically before them in a way that illustrates not only our love for them, but your love for them. Father, we love you. We thank you for the witness of Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. And we thank you that we continue to be instructed by their boldness in the faith 2,600 years later. Thank you, Lord. We pray these things trusting you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our channel. To submit a question about Sunday's sermon, the Bible, or walking with Jesus, click the link in the episode description. Our hosts today are Pastor Jeff Reynolds and myself, Jordan Upton. Our engineer is Elliot Beckley, and our editor is Chad Walden.